with you all tonight. So um, he's resting up. So I hope you get better soon, mate. Um, but yeah, we are still going to run our, our amazing event and we have a, a great talker who hopefully many of you have attended many of his talks in the past at our user group. But to go run through the normal uh, bits and pieces that we always go through, uh, just as a bit of a disclaimer for everybody, uh, the views that you're here tonight are people's of their own, so they're not of their employers. Um, and obviously, those of you that know, know me and Ryan very well, we do work for Microsoft, but this is not affiliated with Microsoft. So anything you hear from myself or anybody else, we will deny. Um, and it's not, you cannot hold it against us. Um, this is really big for us. So this is something we've had from day one on our diversity charter. So if any of you at any uh, point don't feel like the values of this group that are shown on the screen now um, are being upheld or you think that they're being challenged, please do come and speak to us. Come and uh, chat to me in private. Reach out to me afterwards. Hit me up on LinkedIn. Email me, jack at sussexazure.uk. Like whatever you want to do to come and let us know this is not happening because this is for everybody and everybody's welcome here. So if you're not feeling that that's the case, please let me know. So um, we have the awesome Silicon Brighton team tonight. Um, Grace, do you want to come and say a few words about the awesome Silicon Brighton team? So everything you see here is set up by the awesome Silicon Brighton team. Charlie, obviously looking after the AV, who is an absolute legend and helps us out tremendously with this stuff. And Grace, if you want to say a few words about Silicon Brighton. Thank you so much. Um, and really good to see you all. Um, I guess the most important message in terms of the um, support that we're offering this meetup is it's not the only tech meetup that's happening um, across the city. We actually support 30 um, across the tech and digital space uh, that happen on different days of the week throughout the month, throughout the year. Uh, they're all free to attend and they're all hybrid as well. Um, and they're all for any level, any ability. Um, it doesn't matter if you work specifically with that um, sort of skill set or coding programming language, um, or maybe you're just sort of interested in finding out more. We want to make them super accessible and super inclusive. Um, so if you love this group um, and want to keep coming to this one, but also maybe checking out the rest of the tech and digital meetup scene, um, then take a look at siliconbrighton.com. Um, there's loads of other stuff happening. Uh, here's an example of a couple of events that are coming up um, just to show a bit of the breadth as well. So we've got the de game dev drinks that happen on the last Friday of every month. That's a really nice social that just happens in the pub. Um, most of them like this one have all got an element of educational content. The idea is kind of to upskill as well as meet other people, make friends. Um, and then Brighton Data Forum uh, is happening next uh, Wednesday. We've got someone from the Uni of Sussex um, speaking, so that's pretty exciting. Um, but yeah, two, two or three events every single week, pretty much throughout the year, um, uh, including the last, last of the year. This is the last Sussex Azure, but the last meetup for us of uh, 2023. Three, I nearly said 24 then. I'm starting to like in planning mode. Um, but we have the big festive meetup. So um, all of our meetups basically are coming together uh, to meet at the old Albion and Hove. So it's also a chance to just maybe chat to people that you don't meet in this specific group as well. Pick other people's brains, get them to come and join this one. Um, so yeah, if you want to sign up to that, it's free. And the first round is on Silicon Brighton. So please um, come and join us. I think that might be all of our slides. That's all of our slides. Thank you. I'll hand you back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Grace. And yeah, um, do head along to the big festive meetup. Um, it's always a good laugh and a, a good night. And uh, I think the requirement is you have to sign up to the Slack channel to get the first drink. So um, here's the QR code to do that. Um, so uh, I thought I know I get a round of applause. So Science of the Slack channel, uh, it's a really vibrant channel. There's always a good conversation going on there with polls about what's going on or what could we do differently or just finding out about things going on in various communities around um, the Silicon Brighton community. So please do hook, uh, join up and make sure you set up notifications because I personally don't and I miss them and then I catch up about two weeks too late. Uh, so please do sign up and turn those notifications on. Um, also, we've got the amazing venue that we're in tonight. So we're in Runway East. It's our second time at Runway, Runway East. Um, and again, it's provided free of charge to us, which is absolutely incredible. So we've got uh, somebody from Runway East. Uh, sorry, I've forgotten your name already. Natasha. I was going to say Natalie, so that was a good guess that I didn't go with that one. It was close. It was going to end. Um, who's going to say a few words about um, Runway East? Thank you. So just a bit of housekeeping. If you're wondering where the toilets are, then as you exit this door, take 
the immediate left and you'll find the toilets there. Otherwise, drinks and food are here. Um, so hello, I'm Natasha. I'm part of Runway East. And if you've not heard of us before, we're on a mission to destroy boring offices from Bristol to London and now Brighton. So if you are a high growth startup, an SME or an entrepreneur of one to 100 people, then we offer anything from sociable, dedicated desks to private, customized, swanky offices. And recently becoming a B Corps means we get to host lots of lovely events like this, which help us connect with our community. So if you're looking for a new home, do Google Runway East Brighton and we'd be enjoying the chance to get in conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yeah, thank you for the amazing venue. Like We love it here. So easy to set up and uh, a great, great place to be. All right. Um, we also, uh, pizzas tonight, so uh, we're sponsored by Acora, so um, there's a few guys from Acora in the room who will probably w raise their hands. No, they're not going to raise hands. Um, go and speak to those guys if you want to learn more about what Acora uh, do, but thank you very much to Acora for sponsoring tonight's event. And um, I thought I'd just give you a bit of an update on what's happening next year, uh, and this is the status on next year. Uh, we're still working on it. Um, we are thinking uh, with the Silicon Brighton team, there is a lot of cloud meetups um, already. So there's Brighton Cloud, there's AWS, and there's us who cover Azure. We're starting to think about can we join forces and maybe do one a month between us, so over a quarter, um, so that there's you know you can get attend and get a good spread of all the different clouds. Um, and obviously you still get one a quarter of the cloud that you would like to learn about. So yeah, we're working on it. We're actually meeting up tomorrow uh, to discuss a lot of these things. So uh, yeah, stay tuned and um, we'll, we'll keep you up to date via all the different places. Um, and one of the best places to stay up to date is our WhatsApp community. So um, we do post in there what's going on and big updates. So if you aren't signed up to this already, scan this, you'll get into the WhatsApp community um, and we will post announcements and those sort of things for when you need to know what's going on. So I'll leave that there for a few moments. Uh, if any of you don't get in straight away, I have to approve things. Um, and again, our diversity charter still very much applies in the group. So. If anybody gets, hears anything or sees anything or I don't see it, um, we will take action, but please do reach out to us. Um, all right. And with that, we're on YouTube. All, everything from you here tonight will be there uh, after the event straight away, so do go and catch up. And with that, I'm going to hand over to the amazing Mr. Craddock to give us a bit of an update on what's been going on in Entra, or AAD as I still call it, um, because I haven't got out of the habit yet. So with that, John, over to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Oh, that's a good start. <laughs> Runaway mouse. Um, anyway, so good evening and uh, welcome. So I'm uh, John Craddock, as is already said. So I've been working in the identity space since pre-on-premise Active Directory. And whoops, that's, oh, I put the wrong slide deck in. <laughs> Sorry, apologies. I won't be a second. Um, yeah, that was a mistake. <clears throat> I combined slide decks earlier, and um, I just actually put in this this deck. I do apologize for that. Um, I've gone 20, yeah, that is very, very weird. That is not the right deck, because um, I've had Azure Brighton, which I did before, and I've just named it Azure Sussex, right? Apologies, let me. <laughs> That was a, a very bad start, so we hide that and uh, cross, duplicate that. And Charlie, you okay with the feed? Perfect. Yep, okay, good, excellent. So apologies for that. So I've been working in the identity space since uh, pre um, well, on prem Active Directory. In fact, I presented for Microsoft at the launch events for Active Directory in Geneva and, uh, and a couple of places in the States, right back in the very, very early days. First time I did a presentation for Microsoft was, I think, in 1999. So, and prior to that, I'd been working with identity, I'd been working in IBM systems. I got heavily involved in federated identity, again, pre ADFS coming along. And then ADFS came along, I worked with that. I've, I used to do a huge amount of consulting on on-prem AD, 
And then Azure came along, I got very involved in Azure, and now mainly my work is on Azure AD, but of course, in a hybrid environment, what's really important is what's happening on-prem as well. Because you know, if you're gonna get attacked, that you go for the weakest link. And for many people, the weakest link is on-prem. So we've got to make sure everything is absolutely secure. So when I put this idea of this presentation together, I thought, yeah, it's a great idea. Talk about all the new things in, this, in what is now Entra ID, which was previously called Azure AD. And then I started looking at all the different things that were coming out. I thought, how on earth do I do this? Like, it was a huge challenge. So I decided to do it as my award ceremony. So I'm going to talk, first of all, about the new feature life cycle that Microsoft goes through, just so if you've not come across it, you know how it works. And then I've got some listed new features. I'm literally going to talk about those on a line-by-line -line basis. I think it's about eight of them just to make you aware of them. We'll then get into what I call my commended new features, and I'm gonna go into a little bit more technical detail of how those features actually work. And then we've got the winners, and you'll have to see the winning list. And for the winning list, I'm actually gonna get into a demo of each of the winners. Okay, so new site, how many of you worked on private previews? Just. Yeah, so just uh, there's a couple of nods, no hands, but a couple of nods and one hand at the back. Okay, so with a private preview, this is where something first sees the light of day, where you can actually get your hands on it if you're invited to be part of that private preview. Um, some private previews are pretty open. You can sign up on a you know, Microsoft form and put in your details and then join the previews. Others are very private and very secretive. Um, the great thing about being involved in private preview is you have direct interaction with the product group, which can actually be very rewarding because you find out about all sorts of other things that are going on as well. And you've got a chance of actually guiding the product and your feedback can really, really help sort of craft the product into a better, it's being better. Now, if you're part of a private preview, uh, you will probably have a URL feature switch. So when you go to the portal, you see the things that other people can't see, right? So you can see the private preview elements. You may also have to have a test tenant, which is actually onboarded. So your test tenant is onboarded. Um, it's, you know, got the feature added to it, and then you can use it and evaluate it. And you got feedback directly to the product group. Then it goes into public preview, and at this point in time, it's available on all tenants, right? And a tenant, if you're not familiar with the term, think of it as your directory. It's, you know, in terms of Entra ID, it's the identity store. Um, so it's available to all tenants there. And in terms of licensing, you may or you may not require a license. And why I say you may or you may not, the new feature is unlikely to require a unique license. In fact, I've never seen it require a license. But the new feature uses and leverages something that does require a license, such as conditional access. You know, you'd, for conditional access, you would need a P1 license. So, you know, if you go and get a new feature that uses something in conditional access, you'll need the conditional access license. Um, and then, uh, in terms of um, SLAs, there probably isn't one. Depends on how big an organization you are. Sometimes Microsoft will really give a lot of support. Um, but, and also, it's sort of the, the previews are provided as is um, and as available. So sometimes they're not available. So you go to do something and they're doing maybe an update that requires the service to be shut down for a short period of time. Feedback, uh, you can do through the portal, and you can also do it through feedback.zero.com. And then it goes GA, and once it's gone GA, um, then there probably will be some licensing, or may not, depends on you know, what Microsoft decided. But a typical one, for instance, if you take workload identity in public preview, there was no license required for workload identity, but one of the things you could do with it is apply conditional access. So you need a conditional access P1 license. And then, of course, once it went GA, there was a new license requirement for workload identities. 
And the same thing happened with governance fairly recently. Again, your feedback is going to be through the portal or to the feedback website. So it takes you, you through the process. Uh, Azure AD rename, you've probably all heard of it, I'm sure. So Azure AD became Microsoft Entra ID. And when I ask the question, and why, why is this happening? It says, because nobody understands what Azure AD is. So I said, so that means they'll understand immediately what Entra ID is, and this is sort of followed by a little silence. So interesting. Now, Microsoft absolutely claimed it was cut and paste. So if you're updating your documentation, cut and paste. So if it's Azure Active Directory product, it becomes Microsoft Entra ID product, right? So Azure Active Directory Premium P2 would become, obviously, uh, Microsoft Entra ID Premium P2 except when they did the rename, they dropped premium. So it's not exactly cut and paste. Um, and again, when they refer to a feature, if it was an Azure AD feature, such as Azure AD conditional access, uh, you drop the ID out so it becomes Microsoft Entra conditional access. And um, I think you claimed you were gonna do it all by October. Oh, I was it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, uh, well, I, 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 I went through the nightmare of updating a whole lot of documentation. So I said I would do this as an award ceremony. So this one gets the Poopy Award. <laughs> okay, so list of new features. I'm not going to spend very much time on this. Um, if you want to, we're going to have a very short break. You can ask me more details. One of the things I think you should look at, if you haven't, is the user UX. Um, a lot of the more of the user attributes have now been surfaced in the UX. Previously, you had to go to Graph, uh, either using Graph Explorer or your own tools, or using PowerShell to find out information. So that's now available. Um, the next thing is, and this is something I've wanted for a long time, bring in someone as a B2B user. So invite a guest into your, into your directory, and wouldn't it be nice to have a sponsor? Well, now there is a field where you can put in the sponsor. Um, Entra ID recommendations is well worth a look at. There's, uh, if you go to the overview in Entra ID, click on recommendations, you'll get some security recommendations, and that's certainly worth a look as well. And then new dashboards, new dashboards everywhere. And the beauty, of the course, is the visualization they're putting in those dashboards. Make it much easier to consume the information. So again, um, I mean, conditional access, there's a nice dashboard there, authentication method activities, you know, and more and more governance new Git dashboards. Uh, so check out the new dashboards. And then um, this has been around for a while, but it only went into GA a short while back, is the new sign-in branding experience. So when you sign in, uh, normally, what would happen is you would end up with the you know, username, password sitting in the middle of the screen with a background image behind it. Well, now you can shift that around. But the one I, I particularly like, want, like about it is you can have a cascading style sheet now for your branding page. And also, uh, you can customize the self-service password reset. So you can actually remove the link if you want to from the sign-in dialog. You can also change the link so it goes to your own portal. So you can, if you've got an implementation of self-service password reset, you can do it to your own portal. Um, there's new log analytic workbooks, and there's also new uh, Microsoft Entra verified ID features. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come and look at those in a little bit more detail, because they're worth a bit, of, bit more of a, a shout out. Uh, oh, hang on, sorry. Um, Hang on, sorry. Uh, let me just go back. I made a whole bunch of changes, actually. No, that's it, new branding. So what I want to do now is look at the commended new features. And first thing is API-driven inbound provisioning. This is something I've wanted for a very, very long time. I wanted an industry standard way of actually putting users into the directory. And if you have a look in the enterprise blade, what you'll find is there are two applications. And if you just do a search on API driven, um, what you'll find two apps. One app 
will actually provide an API for provisioning into the entry ID, and the other one will do it for provisioning into on-prem. And the beauty of that is, is it uses the Cloud Sync agent, so which you might well have deployed anyway for doing Cloud Sync, so synchronizing your users from on-prem into the cloud. Um, and that's, that's available as the Cloud Sync agent. It uses that, and it is using Skim. So Skim is the system for cross-domain identity management. It's industry standard, and it uses the Skim core user schema and also the enterprise user schema extensions. Um, and the beauty of it is, if you want to do a customization, so you, rather than you've got a special mapping you need to do, because you're bringing from a source somewhere of your system of record, you're bringing these users in, whatever that's, that system of record might be. If you need to do a customization, you just deploy another app. And you call, so you've got API 1, API 2, both have some form of you know, mapping. You bring in API 3, which has a different form of mapping. So you can call that. Um, and also, um, to go with that, there's sort of various sort of things that will probably happen. Number one, um, which is already happening, is you've got your system of record. You might well have to do a dump of the or the extraction of data. You might bring it into a flat file system. You might bring it into a SQL store, something like that. Well, now you can take from there directly using sort of fairly industry standard automation tools and put them in to the API. Uh, standard tools because we're using Skim, all right? Um, but Microsoft provides you with PowerShell and also Logic Apps to do it. And then you'll get your ISVs who will actually build tools to go directly from their system of record directly into your target. So your on-prem AD or Entra ID. And then, of course, you could have system integrators that pull from multiple system of records and actually bring that information in. So lots of scope for third-party enhancements, but what I've been waiting for for a long time is the APIs to be available, and now they are. So the next thing is um, governance lifecycle workflow. I think this is so important. Um, it's worth mentioning. It's been actually GA'd for a while. However, the, there was a huge number of improvements that happened going from a, a public preview into GA. And the lifecycle workflows, you've got a workflow for joiners, you've got a workflow for movers, and you've got a workflow for leavers. And what's really, really important, if you want to do zero trust and you want to do least privilege, you've got to make absolutely certain people are provisioned correctly. And this gives you that capability. So what do you need when someone joins? Well, they'll need to be in certain groups, all right? They may need a temporary access pass to get in to begin with so that they can set up their authenticator app and all sorts of other bits and pieces. Again, mover, you want to come out of some groups, you want to go into other groups, you want to be provisioned, deprovisioned from some apps and provisioned to other apps. So we need these workflows and they are so important in terms of a security perspective. Uh, what we should be in a situation is with no more do we have any of those orphaned accounts. They should never be around. But equally well, we should not have overprivileged users. So someone shouldn't be in a group, have access to an application that they no longer need. And that's the beauty of doing these life circle workflows. Um, there are templates. So you've got, you know, you've got a sort of onboard pre-hire, you've got an onboard new hire, you've got a post onboarding, right? So different templates. And um, you can't, there's no, there's no sort of, oh, let's make my own template button. But what you can do is use one of the predefined templates, modify it, and then save it. So you've got that capability. And if you, if you look at it, you, in terms of the workflow, you have a trigger for the workflow. You then have a scope, so that's who it applies to, and then you have what the workflow is, and it's an ordered list. And if you look at that, you can see that some of those workflows are for joiners, some of them for levers, some of them for movers, um, you know, some of them for all three. And the, so the, the, you know, add a user to a group, very useful. Disable a user account. Uh, you've got generate a tap, a temporary access pass. 
And, and also, you've got the capability of doing custom task extensions, which actually call out to an Azure Logic app. So you could actually do anything you like with this. So my next one is uh, dynamic groups with time-based membership. And actually, the one that the, lots of people have mentioned, the time-based membership. But the nicest feature of this is rule validation that they've now introduced. Um, and the idea here is that we can now have an employee hard date attribute, and we can base your membership of a group based on your employee hard date, but by processing that with greater than or less than an equal. So we've got greater than or equal or less than an equal operators. So you could do something like this, uh, user dot employee hard date less than, and you put the date in, right? You'll be a member of the, of the group right, because it's a dynamic allocation into the group. And then you can get more complicated, so you can do, you know, the date less than the system time now, minus seven days, or plus seven days, or whatever you want to do in terms of that. So that, that is really, really useful. And, um, and then actually, if you want to design your own sort of governance workflow, that would be really helpful to achieve that and then use it as a trigger. Um, the other really nice thing, I, I think, is the rule validation, and I think that needs a call out because what we can do is we can add users and test them um, to this dynamic membership and see whether they're actually in the group or out of the group. Um, that's, that's something that actually um, I've been asking for for a long time, and finally it's here. Uh, the next commended feature I wanted to bring up is the restricted management administrative units. Um, the AUs were something that were in, uh, I think I was one of the first users with a company of AUs. And it was one of these things that was in preview for a very, very, very long time. And it was only surfaced through PowerShell. So there's no UX for it at all. Now it's there's a UX for it, and also uh, we've now introduced this concept of restricted. So if you look at a, a U itself, the idea is that we can group together a bunch of users, a bunch of groups, a bunch of devices, and we can do administration over that. So there's a Baden AU, and there's a Baden delegated admin allowed to do things to those users in there. And then we've got an Oslo one over there, and again, we've got a delegated administrator for Oslo. Problem is, though, there are sometimes there are people in Baden and people in Oslo that you don't want, you know, an ordinary administrator actually changing their thing. So password reset, CXO password reset, for instance. Well, we've got this concept now of the delegated admin, but we've also got root level admin coming in as well. Okay, so that a root level administrator can manage in both of those AUs. But now what we can do is we can gather people together into a restricted um, administrative unit and we can have delegation over that and it blocks from root level. So if you've got a global administrator at root level, they cannot manage people inside the restricted AU. Of course, because they're a global administrator, they could give themselves the power to do that, but by default, they can't do it. And of course, if they gave themselves the power, that's auditable, so we could, we could get them anyway. Um, and then, of course, it blocks. So somebody, this person here in the Baden AU, uh, is blocked. The Baden delegate administrator is now blocked from changing that. So this is a really nice feature, really simple to deploy. You just come in, you create an administrative unit, and you mark it as a restricted, right? And, you know, it needs a bit of thinking out as to exactly why you're doing it. And, and with all these sort of security enhancements, whatever you're doing, it's the process of thinking out what you want to achieve first. But it's really useful that that's now available. Um, the next thing I've got is this uh, privileged roles and permissions. And I'm really looking all the time at least privilege. I'm not talking about least privilege just for roles and permissions, least privilege for absolutely everything. So is a user allowed to access an app? If they're not, they shouldn't be able to. So 
you know, restrict them. Uh, if they're doing a, an administrative role, you know, give them just what they need. Now, the problem is with a lot of administrative roles, there's a potential to do an elevation of privilege attack, right? But which roles can achieve that? Well, Microsoft now flagged them and marked them as privilege. So if you are in a privileged role, you need to be at a higher level of trust as an administrator. Um, so I just think it's a, it's a nice feature where they've tagged them. Um, they've got a best practice recommendation of a maximum of five global administrators, a maximum of 10 privileged role administrators. I think the, the 10 privileged role administrators could be restricted in a very large organization. I absolutely agree with the five global admins. I probably have less, actually, to be honest. But um, And then, obviously, what you need to do in terms of any role assignment is to use PIM, Privileged Identity Management, and also um, you investigate with access reviews, so we need to run those. And, of course, MFA, well, it says for all admin accounts, but I would say for all accounts. So the, the next one here is the Microsoft Graph uh, Activity Log. This has been a long time coming, but it's now available. So you can do this. What, we, what you need to do, though, is you need to bring it into a log analytic workspace so you can actually analyze it properly. Or you can bring it into your SOM uh, solution as well. So you've got, um, this is just showing it here, you've got a KQL. This is in the log analytic workspace. And there are more and more and more logs coming out. And you go, you look down that list and you suddenly say, oh, network activity log. You think, what on earth is that about? Well, we'll come to that shortly. Um, so the idea is uh, here is you can bring it into a log analytic workspace, which you can run your, oops, gone the wrong way. You can run your KQL on right, and um, see exactly what's going on. Anyone know what KQL stands for? Kusto query language. Anyone know where Kusto came from? Anyone come across Jacques Cousteau, the, the French diver? That's what he's named after, sort of diving deep into your logs. Um, so <clears throat> we then got the uh, log analytic workbooks. Do check these out. They are so helpful because uh, KQL is not the easiest. It's not difficult, but it's not the easiest of language either. Um, of course, now you've got the ability of creating KQL using CodePilot, all right? So that's going to be a really nice uh, feature. Um, but ju just check out the logs. The beauty of the logs, the sorry, the workbooks, beauty of the workbooks is they'll do the analysis for you and they will render for you as well. So I've just got a couple of examples there. There's the authentication policy, prompts, and also um, I pulled this one out because I still see um, ADL on applications. ADL is the Active Directory Authentication Library. Right, Microsoft withdrew security fixes in June, I think it was June, wasn't it, this year? June or July, uh, June of this year. Um, and therefore, absolutely, your app should not be using ADL. So if you've got an app that's using ADL, you want it to be updated, right? Because otherwise, potential security vulnerability. The beauty of this is it shows you if it's using ADL, so you can pick it out. Um, and then if you, again, it requires the log analytics integration. And then there are, uh, I don't know, when I did a screen capture of this probably a, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, there's probably even more workbooks now available. Um, and then the, the new Microsoft Entra verified ID features. Um, and I don't know, anyone using verified IDs? Yeah, it's sort of, a, yeah, in, in earnest. Um, I mean, it's, it's sort of still it's in its infancy. I wish it would move forward because I think it's actually a really good, useful technology. The problem is with verified IDs, what you needed is you needed a, an Azure subscription. And originally, your definitions of your verified IDs had to go into blob storage. They got rid of that. Now you needed an Azure subscription just for the uh, Key Vault. Right? Now they've got rid of that requirement as well. And you literally go in to verified IDs, click Get Started, and the next thing you can do 
is you can generate your very own verified ID uh, without, without having to think about storage faults, anything else. You do need a verified domain. So you need, do need a verified domain. And uh, so during the, the, uh, the private preview of this, um, yeah, the, the, a lot of comments were, it's too quick. You know, you literally click it, bang, you can create a verified ID. And the people wanted it slowed down, so it looked more complicated what was going on behind the scenes. Um, but, um, yeah, so problem is uh, you've got a verified ID, you can create one, um, but how do you give it to the user? Well, normally you'd have to do a bit of code to do it. Now that is built into myaccounts.microsoft.com. You've got this thing of get my verified ID, and you choose that, and it'll come up with a QR code, which you scan with your authenticator app, and after that, you actually have in your wallet a verified ID that's been issued by your organization. If you've got a picture, the picture will be in, on the verified ID, um, and also all the information, well, the information that they bring, bring into the verified ID comes out of enter ID, all right? So your display name, et cetera, et cetera. And you can then present that, and it's all, you know, if, you, if uh, actually my session must be online, I think, isn't it? So I, I did a verified ID session oh, a year ago, probably, yeah. Um, but but this, is a, this is a very nice enhancement. The other thing that is really good is face check. And face check, um, it, it, uh, you are asked uh, to create, you know, take a selfie video right, during the presentation of a verified ID. The verified ID needs your picture on it. And what it will then do is it will use the Azure Cognitive Services to do a uh, you know, facial recognition or picture facial match between what's on your verified ID and what selfie you're taking, and it also does a liveness check. So very nice features. Oh, and now it's the commercial break. Commercial yeah, break. so how, how long are we going to have? Five minutes. Five minutes? Five minutes and, and, and then we'll come back for the winners. <laughs> Uh, mixing Verified it. ID, that's, that's a big bonus. Like no key vault, no storage account. Yeah, yeah. Because that was like a big...
Oh, yeah, right. Let's move on to the... Uh, and now, the winners. Okay, so in the third prize goes to custom authentication extensions. And you might be wondering what a custom authentication extension is. Um, so is my customer until I explain what they actually did. We, we had a problem. We could not get one customer to move off ADFS. They had an application, and this application used the ADFS claims pipeline to populate a token that you know, was presented to prove authentication to the app with all sorts of stuff coming out of SQL databases and everything else. And he said, you can't implement that in um, you know, intro. Well, at that point, he said, you can't Im implement it in Azure Active Directory, as it was called at the point in time but you've got custom extensions. So what is a custom extension exactly? So we have our, our user sitting at their browser, their user agent, um, they hit the, the application, the application says you're not authenticated, shoots them off to enter ID. And we get to enter ID, we enter our username, we enter our password, uh, we do MFA, whatever else is required of us, and then we may, if, it's, uh, if the application is uh, OAuth2, Open ID connect app, then it will be uh, at that point in time. Um, it may ask for consent. And then the next thing that happens is that we have a token issuance start event. And now Microsoft will call out at that point to your own API. So now we're out of the API, feeding all the information about the user that's just signing in to the API. And then what the API can do is whatever it likes. So it could take from a SQL store, you know, look the user up in a SQL store, grab attributes from that, populate them, and send that lot back. Now we're back into Enter ID. Enter ID then builds the token, and this could be a SAML token or an ID token. So if you're using Open ID Connect, it's an ID token. If you're using SAML, um, it's a SAML token. Then we reply with the augmented token, which goes back to the app, and the app has exactly what it needs. And this, the customer looked at this and said, we can use this, we can move away from ADFS. All right? So what I want to do is give you a little demo of that and also show you um, something that's uh, quite interesting if you've never seen it before, and you might like to play with it to look at, there's a, look, there's a lot of call outs that are beginning to happen um, from Entra ID. You know, certain things happen and there's a potential to call out to an API. And you go, yeah, but what's it send? I'll show you where you can actually look at that information. So I'm going to start off in here and I'm going to go down under identity and we're looking for external identities and custom authentication extension preview. And there is my custom um, actual extension that I've got in there. So we just open that up. And what I've got is it's, it's got a, a, obviously a GUID because everything's identified by a GUID, but the event is token issuance start. And this is the only one event at the moment, but I think it was, looks to me like there's gonna be other events coming in here that we could use. And by the way, can you see that back back there on the back row yeah okay good good otherwise i could do a bit of zooming um the next thing is okay token issuance start where do we go we go to this uh endpoint which is custom extension pipe i've called it and there's a url that's what it's going to call and it's got it's pipe dream anyone use pipe dream you do, okay. So Pipe Dream is really, really useful, and I'll show you that in action. So that's what it's gonna call, and then what we do is we define what's going to be sent back. So here I've just got API version, date of birth, some custom rules, etc. So we're saying what we're gonna send back from this API we're calling out to. So that's, that's that component. So that's the custom extension. The next job is we, go to the application and I've got my enterprise app in here and I'm going to just find my app, which is just a test for authentication. And I'm gonna look at that. And what we've got is under um, sign, single sign-on, we've got the capability 
of defining a cut the use of a custom claims provider. So that's my custom claims provider, custom extension pipe, and these are the attributes I expect to get back from it. Okay, so that's defined it now for the application. So I've got a, a, a little bit of a, a cheat going on here, which I'll show you in one second. This is Pipe Dream. Pipe Dream, you literally go into it. It's, there's a free version, which works very nicely. Um, and what you do is you set up a, a workflow. And then what you'll have is this is the endpoint it gives you, which is a public URL. And when you call that public URL, it will tell you everything that is packed in the call. So, you know, if it's a post to that URL, you have a body and it shows you everything that's in the body. And the other beauty of this thing, it's a workflow. So you can, you can then have it trigger some code so you can actually respond from it as well. So that, that's Pipe Dream. And we'll use it in one second. And here I've got a little bit of cheaty code that works very nicely. Uh, this is the endpoint, the authorized endpoint. This is where I go. Hit the app, sends you up to enter ID. It says to that endpoint. And the, this message is basically saying, please authenticate this user, the user to this application, which is identified by client ID. Response type is I want an ID token back. And then I want to redirect to uh, jsonwebtoken.ms. And the jsonwebtoken.ms is a way of displaying a JSON web token. And what it's going to do, it's going to redirect to this. And when it redirects to it, the ID token will be part of the URL. And you'll see that working in one second. So we'll go off and actually use this. So I've actually got that in here. And so I'm signing in. And as soon as I've signed in, the issuance start event takes place, sends me across here. So what's happened is, if you can see that, JSON web token hash ID token equals. So it's got the ID token back in the response. I've thrown it into jsonwebtoken.ms, and it's displaying the, the result. Okay, But we've got this back having called out to the API. So let's go and look at the API. So if we go to the API itself, uh, we can see that we've got a, a post event coming. And you can drill into the post event to see exactly what it contained. So we can go down and look at its uh, data. We can uh, look at the source, the, the service principle involved, and so on. But what I want to show you is just um, the user details are here. And if we just look at that, what you can see is the display name is John Williams. The given name is John. We've got an ID. Uh, we've got a mail address. Uh, we've got a surname and the user principal name. And even got our on-premise, because this is a hybrid user, come from on-premise. We've got the on-premise uh, security identifier or SID. So all of that has been issue and start, call out to the API. Here, API, this is who's involved. All right? Um, <clears throat> and then what I can do is I can actually chain this with a, a bit of code. And um, this is actually written in Node.js. And all it's doing is actually uh, sending back some info. So in there, what I've got is I'm sending back an API version. So I'm not looking up anything in any external store, but I could have done. I could have called out into a SQL store or something. And what I've done is I, I've set the date of birth. I've got a custom role of writer and reader. And that is the information I'm going to send back. But of course, this code could have looked anywhere to get that information. And who's it going to get it for? Well, we've got all the details of the user. So we can do it based on that. So this then um, sends back a response. And we end up here. And if we look down the bottom, what we can see is that we've got our custom role, uh, reader and uh, writer in here. Uh, we've got the uh, API version 1.0.0. We've got the date of birth in there and so on. And, and that's a custom extension for you. So really powerful and really useful. And what I wanted to do is, is a lot of people I know go, oh, yeah, but what is it? What is it send? All right. When you, you know, there's, there's, um, there's a workflow for onboarding users. 
and there's a number of places where it can call out to an API. And using this, you can actually call out to Pipe Dream. Uh, you can see what it sends. And then what you can do is you can probably find a bit of code that will respond for you and then, then use it. OK, so in second place, what we've got is we've got conditional access for protected actions. Um, and this is, you know, working on the principle of least privilege. This is really, really good. So to be able to use this, what we need to use is authentication context. And if you're not familiar with an authentication context, um, what we can have is a start action. And we'll see what that start action is in a second. That in itself can trigger an authentication context, right? which can then can trigger a conditional access policy. So we can have a start event, right? And an example of a start event would be we hit a website, you know, we authenticate to the website, we're working on the website, we hit a page, and that triggers an authentication context, which triggers a conditional access. So access to that particular page, maybe we can only go to that page if we're coming from a compliant device or the user's agreed terms of use. Or if we're not using MFA for everyone, they require MFA. So we can do a step up authentication. So we trigger the, this and we can increase our assurance. Maybe we you know, get the terms of use agreed, which is an increased assurance. Maybe we get them to do MFA. And then of course, what we can do is we can allow or block. So now we could be going to a website and going to the website, you can do a conditional access policy to say to use this website, you need a compliant device, or we could just allow the user to authenticate the website. When we go to a particular page, it triggers an authentication context, which says you need to be on a compliant device. So on a per page basis, I can now trigger conditional access policies. But not only can you do that, you can also now use this thing called protected actions. And a protected action is triggered, it triggers an a, a authentication context when you use a particular permission in Azure AD or Entra ID. All right, so we can get some really fine grain control. And, and what I'll show you that is in action with some conditional access uh, administration. So. We'll, we'll start off where in the um, going here, and I'm going into the entry portal, and I'm going to into the entry portal as James. James is just an ordinary user, so we'll log in as James, and we'll enter his code. And having entered his code, we'll verify him. So he needed a code from his uh, authenticator. And now we're in as James. Let's go to protection. Let's go down to conditional access. And you don't have access to the data, right? It's just an ordinary user. We could prevent him using the, port the portal completely, right? But, you know, I just wanted to show you that as an ordinary user, yes, you can get in the portal, but certain things you just can't see at all. Okay. So let's, uh, let's change that experience and uh, let's actually go in as another user. Um, this user is actually <clears throat> a conditional access administrator. So this is John going in with a thing, and John is going to use a FIDO2 key for his uh, second factor. He could have gone passwordless, but he just decided to use that. And then what we've got is we're in as John, and we're going to protection, conditional access, and if we go down under here, policies, uh, you can get a new policy, and yeah, we could create a new policy and so on, okay. But what if we only wanted John to be able to create a new policy if he was in the London office? How could we deal with that, All right? We could, we, could, we could block him from doing things completely in the portal, but, on a, on a, we want him to be able to see conditional access policies wherever he is, because he is a conditional access administrator, but we only want him changing policies when he's in the London office. And this is where protected actions come in. So let's actually go and set up 
a protected action. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually go over as my user, Tor. So we're now, Tor is an administrator, and he's going to go down, and he's going to come down into conditional access. And what he's going to do, first of all, is go into authentication context and go new authentication context. Now, what you've got, the authentication context is an ID, C4. So there's actually potential to have 25 different authentication contexts. But, you know, to have select C4 in, in, a, in a UX wouldn't be very nice. So you can give this thing a, a friendly name. So what we'll do is we'll call this in here, we'll call this London only. So we're going for London only and save that. And that's created the authentication context. So I'm going to go now for a new policy, and I've already got the name here in the, the clipboard, so we just drop that in there. We're going to apply this to a selected user. And by the way, when, whenever I um, do in anything to do with conditional access in a, a test environment, I always use, um, unless I need to test a group, I always do it directly for the user. Because what I want, don't want to have to do is scratch my head and think, oh, which group is John in? All right, I want to test something with John. That's why I, I, I use users here. So here we've got, this is now is for John. And the target resource would normally be, you know, the conditional access policy would apply if John is going to a particular resource. Instead of that, what we do is we use an authentication context. And notice we got London only in here. So we select that authentication context, the London only one. And then next job is the condition. We're going to say this or the conditional access policy will apply from any network location, excluding, and here we have to select the London office. Well, we only have a UK office, so we're going to choose the UK office. So now that's done. And what are we going to do in terms of the conditional access policy? We come into our grant and we're going to block. So what this is saying is if it's John, right, and this authentication context is triggered, right, which is London only, what we're going to do is if he's on any network location, excluding the London office, we're going to block access. Right? So that's what that policy is actually doing. So we'll turn it on and we'll create it. Uh, my next job is I need to uh, actually go and uh, come down to roles and admins. And I go to protected actions. And then I choose the actions that I want to protect in this way. So set permissions. And these are literally permissions. So here we've got group policy uh, sorry, conditional access, update, create, and delete. So we're going to choose those three. And what we're going to say is if any of these are used, we're going to trigger the authentication context, and the authentication context is going to be London only. Okay, so that is that. That's done. We'll save that. And now we're sort of in a position now to do a little bit of a test. So what we're going to do is we are actually in London. So we're going to go as John. So we're going to sign in as John in London. And do the sign in there. OK. And of course, he's in London, so we should expect him to be able to uh, do, you know, if we got it right, if we go to protection, conditional access, uh, and go policies, you know, new policy, uh, you'd expect that to actually be doable. Okay, so let's, uh, let's now go across to somewhere other than London. Okay, so we're now on a different network and using a different client. So we're coming over here now, and we're going in as John. And we're signing John in with his MFA. 
glad to see we got MFA for everybody. And now what we'll do is as John, remember he's a conditional access administrator. And what we're gonna do come down here is go to protected actions, conditional access, and we're gonna go uh, policies and we can go and edit a policy. And this looks good, except down here, it says editing is protected by additional access requirement. Click here to re-authenticate, okay? Not gonna do it there. We'll do it somewhere else in a second. So we come back here and we now go to new policy, selected actions protected by additional access requirements. Do you wish to continue? Yes, we'll continue and now we're blocked okay so we can do the editing and everything else in london and the creation but we can't do it anywhere else and that's the beauty of protected actions so you know again working on the principle of least privilege uh we're really gaining uh, a lot of well <clears throat> a lot of very fine control and the winner okay now that's an interesting one have you got uh... right thank you jack and the winner is we have need a drum roll here ready <laughs> thank you jack it's microsoft enter global secure access featuring microsoft enter internet access and also microsoft in private access so what do these guys do, do for us? And this is Microsoft's implementation of a security service edge. And if you look at a security service edge, the idea is that how you get from your client to the app is through a security edge. So our clients can connect on one side and our apps can connect on the other side of the edge. Now the clients, when they connect, we can authenticate them, we can do conditional access. So is your client allowed to connect to the edge? Authenticate, conditional access. Can you get to an application? Authenticate, conditional access, right? And then you can have security controls in between. So at the moment, there's a secure web gateway, right, which we can use. Um, in the future, and I think I can sort of say this because Microsoft said it at, um, at um, Ignite, um, there's going to be all sorts of um, additional security controls, such as data loss prevention, right? There will be um, cl cloud firewall at some point, threat protection. And, and that's the beauty is you can leverage these, these services. So if you connect and go to your apps through the secure edge, you can leverage all the services that are going to be available. So again, uh, we've got the Microsoft Global Network, um, which allows us to have points of presence pretty much um, across, well, across the world. I think 180 right now, something like that. And there's a figure of they are 73% of them are close to populations, right? So the, the most populated have, you know, areas have 73% access to a point of presence. Microsoft want to push that. So they want to say that for the whole world, 80% will be close to a pop. Right. Well, actually, I think it's more than 80 percent, but I'm not sure of the exact figures. So you're, you're connecting through the Microsoft very fast, very performant, very reliable network. So we connect and we connect from a client. Today, the client is Windows, right? Windows 10, Windows 11. But very soon you will see an Android, you'll see iOS and you'll see Mac. Right, and probably even more, you know. So I would expect you probably see a Linux client before you know it, all right? But I've no idea of timelines for that. So the, the today I say it's Windows 10, Windows 11. So AuthN CA evaluation. Now, what traffic do we send up there? Well, that's done through three traffic profiles. So there's M365 as a traffic profile. There's private and there's internet. Um, M365 is an internet profile, but it's specific for all the M365 sort of SharePoint, you know, exchange on, online, etc. So these guys 
um, actually communicate with the GSA client, or I should say the other way around, the GSA client communicates with them, and it pulls the traffic profile. So now the GSA client says, oh, you're trying to go there. You need to go to the edge. Okay, so that's done there. Um, the next thing is that we can connect, and we can connect to M365. And the beauty of it is, if you are going through the uh, security service edge, then you've got things like all your tokens are protected. So token theft is a thing of the past. Um, and again, to go to any of those apps, you auth n, you do conditional access. Okay. Now you can go to internet access. Well, today you can't, but um, it is by the end of the year, internet access will go into public preview. At the moment, that component is not in public preview. Uh, M365 is, and the other thing that's in public preview is private access. And the beauty of private access is we can go to an application on-prem, in the Amazon cloud, in Google cloud, in some other cloud, right? And we connect to the application, but to a segment on the application. So we're actually connecting to an IP address, a port number, and a protocol which TCP, UDP. Today, if you look, you don't have UDP. But again, by the end of the year, you will have UDP when that goes into public preview. So we're not connecting to any networks. We're connecting to an application segment. Right? So again, least privilege. And then what you've got is the ability to do a remote network. So you can have a branch office network, and you need um, a, a on-premise device that will do IPsec. OK, um, so that is basically the uh, security service edge. And uh, how does the branch office know about the routes? Well, it's BGP. So Bordergate Protocol is advertising the routes. So what is the great about an SSE? Well, if you think about it as a VPN, if you think about what's the challenge of a VPN, you know, you've got a VPN. And then I know so many companies that were super challenged by VPN when everyone was sent home to work, right? Because their VPN didn't have the capacity, they were in the wrong location, et cetera. So you were hairpinning through the VPN, doing all sorts of things. With this, there's a global network with po points of presence all over the place. Um, so scaling, performance, redundancy, you don't even have to think about it, okay? And then on the other side, um, we've got the ability to go out to our applications, and we can go to internet sites. Uh, we've got the M365, but of course, we've got on-premise. And again, you're not connecting to the on-premise network. So, you know, if you connect on a VPN, you can do port scanning, you can do all sorts of horrible things, and, and looking to elevate your privilege. Here, you're connecting to a application segment, as in, you know, you're connecting to SMB. You're know, connecting to, um, you know, so SMB as in, as in a file share. Um, and then, of course, uh, you can leverage what security controls Microsoft give you. Uh, so, you know, data loss prevention comes in. Yes, tick in the box. We'll have, we'll have a bit of that, all right? Um, the other thing Microsoft have, have concentrated on, on very much is if you already have an SSE solution, then... Um, this will work side by side. So you could have some traffic routed through this. You could have some traffic routed through your other SSE solution of some kind. Okay. So uh, as a side by side install. Um, right. It meet, Mac meets all the requirements of zero trust. So all access to the SSE and applications authenticated. So. How do you connect to the SSE? You have to get authenticated. How do you go to an app? You have to be authenticated, right? So conditional access on both sides. So verify explicitly, very much one of the tenets of zero trust. The next thing, access limited to application segments, least privilege access. So it gives you that capability. And then all traffic and behaviors constantly monitored, which is the assumed breach tenant of zero trust. And yes, the monitoring is very, very good. You've, you've, got, um, you've got much better SharePoint logs with this. So the SharePoint logging has been enhanced. It's qu much quicker. 
um, and it also gives you much more information. Um, and also you've got all the traffic logs that go with this. So let's have a little demo of uh, global secure access. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm starting off on my client machine. At the moment, the GSA client is disabled. So it's disabled here. So what we're going to do is we're going to go and uh, just ping to SharePoint. And we can see that it's, uh, we're connecting to uh, 13.107.138.8. And that's coming back. Let's turn the GSA client on. So we've gone directly to SharePoint there. Now we've turned the GSA client on. And what we'll find is we are actually being the, it, it's actually got the, the correct uh, IP in here because that that's, should be shown correctly. But we're connecting to 6.6.0.19 rather than to 13.107. Uh, and the reason being is we're going through the edge, okay? So that's, that's actually t turned on that and we're going to the edge through there. If I go to home on here and down to the, um, where are we, connect, and we choose traffic forwarding, these are the traffic forwarding profiles. Uh, now, I, I asked the question, could I show the internet one today? Because, um, but they, they they said, well, it's really not going into public preview till the end of the year. So, well, actually, by the end of the year, whatever that means. By the end of which year? They don't say which year. <laughs> okay, so, uh, but you would have you'd have an internet profile here as well, okay? So, uh, in terms of the, the uh, 365 access profile, uh, I can look at the policies. I've got one for SharePoint, one for, you know, the Office Online, et cetera, uh, Exchange Online. And we look at the SharePoint one. What we can see is that we've got IP subnet 13107136.0 slash 22. So it's a CEDA address. Um, and that would forward all that traffic up through here. Now, if I don't want to do it, if I don't want to forward it, because I want someone else to manage this, um, I would you can bypass. But I, the, I mean, I think if you're going to Microsoft's own you know, equipment, as in Microsoft M365, I would certainly be using the Microsoft SSE to get there, okay? But it shows you the potential for you know, going and using different solutions. So I don't have to send the traffic through here, but I am in this particular case. So let's come down here and we'll go off to SharePoint. At uh, the moment, it's enabled, so we're going through the edge. Um, so that's absolutely fine, and we're in. So we're just going to sign this guy out because SharePoint is using a persistent cookie. So we'll get rid of that, and then we'll turn off the this. So we're going to pause this here, and we can go off again. And here, the, the default behavior is, yeah, you can go over through the edge or you can go over the internet. And you might go, well, hang on a minute, I want to force everything through the edge. Well, that's where conditional access policy kicks in. So we just sign that out and we can go over to looking at that and we'll go down to, uh, where are we? Uh, identity protection and conditional access. So we come down here. And what we're looking at down here is we're looking for a policy. And uh, where are we? 26, I think. Hang on. Yeah, 26 is the policy. And uh, what we're doing is the user specified is James Bond. Uh, the target, uh, the application is SharePoint. And the condition is uh, all network locations right, excluding, and here we're excluding all compliant network location. Compliant network location is the security service edge, right? So we're excluding all those, and guess what we're going to do? We're going to come down here, and we're going to block access. So we're blocking access for all network locations except the compliant network. So now, if we enable this guy and save that, we can go back over to our SharePoint 
And let's go again to the SharePoint up here. And I'll log in and it says you can't access it because we left, we remember we, we left the client switched off because I showed you it going directly and then going through the internet, or sorry, going through the edge and then going through the internet. If we re-enable the client, then what we'll discover is that we've, if we resume that, we can go and uh, this time we should be successful. So now you've got all the great protection that's now available to you. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at another scenario. So we'll get rid of that. And we'll, get, we'll go now to an SMB share. So this is an SMB share sitting on-prem, okay? And coming in here, and I'm actually connected through to the SMB share. Uh, which has not the, that's uh, the data on the SMB share. Oh, I just noticed that gives some passwords away. Doesn't matter that environment isn't running anymore. <laughs> um, but let's go and look at a, uh, doing RDP session to a domain controller. And it's prompting me to sign in. So, and I'm blocked. And the reason I'm blocked is because what we've done is it does conditional access. It can do. I'm not showing conditional access here. What I've done is I've published this as an application, and I've said that the application, you have to assign a user before you can use the app. So let's actually look at that, and uh, we can just go across and, and look at the application itself. And so what we need to do is come down into the global secure access, looking at applications, there's this thing called quick access. Uh, and the idea being is that what you'll probably do is when you first use this, you won't think about, oh, what authentication do I want for this, that, the other one, the other thing. You just have a quick access, which is a way of getting through to all your application segments. So all of them uh, through one thing. And then what you'll do is you'll think, actually, you know what? I could really leverage the additional security by doing it on a per application basis. Right? And there's a workbook to help you do that. So it will actually analyze the traffic and what's being used. So here, um, on this particular IP address, 10.0.0.7, uh, I'm allowing a connection to 445, which is my SMB share. So that's being done through quick access. And then if we look at enterprise applications, uh, I've got one set up, which is RDP. If I select that, and if we have a look at our users, and now actually let's look at the properties first. And if we come down here, it says assignment required. And that's why I have to be assigned to this app before I can actually use it. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign my user to the application. So we'll just do that. So we're going to find James Bond, assign him to the app. So now he'll be able to use this app, which if we look at where we're connecting to, this is the network access properties. We're going to 10.0.0.7 on 3389. So an RDP session, okay, so just to that. Um, and of course, we, we, because, because this is published as RDP, I can now actually also do conditional access against it if I want to. But we'll, we'll just stick with that. And uh, let's go and experience it now. We'll go across and uh, do see if we can get into that RDP session having assigned James. Okay, so let's just swing back again and close that off. And then we're going to our domain controller and we're connecting And there we are with an RDB session to our domain controller, okay? And remember, I've not connected to a network at all. What I've done is I've connected to an application segment, which gives me my least privilege. And that is global secure access. And, and that, that's the, uh, that, you know, that's why I think, think of it as probably worthwhile selecting that as the winner. So thank you, Jack, for approving that winning. <laughs> 
Um, so, you know, we looked at my listed features, we looked at the, the sort of commended new features, and we also looked at the, the winners. And the um, question is, what's your winning new feature? And uh, I don't know, do you want to have a vote for, which one would you go for, anyone? Which you like best? The, the, the last one, SSE. Everybody loves us to see. Okay. <laughs> um, by the way, I, I, I produced a, it's about a one hour long video on SSE. It's on, it's on uh, what I'll do is while Jack just finishes off, uh, let me just um, break out of this and find the, the opening slide. Oh, it's, oh, there it was. Uh, let me just find that. And then, well, actually, Jack, if you want to uh, finish up, I'll, I'll find this and just give the YouTube link. There we go. Um, so do that. And I think we're probably going to have to come back in here. And just reselect this screen. I don't know why it's not doing it automatically. Magic. Okay. Oh, <laughs> and that, that's now covering it. <laughs> All right. Um, there, there's my YouTube channel. It's just, uh, it's just at, at John underscore credit. There is a, a, a QR code there if you want. And, that, and that's it. That's my winning selection. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Can we give John a round of applause, please? Uh, if any of you haven't checked out John's YouTube channel, highly recommend. Uh, they are super, super deep technical dives. They're not your typical sort of level 100, level 150 skimming the top of it. That it starts there and then goes right into the detail. Um, and I would use them for catching up. SSE one, I've, I've watched myself. Definitely go check it out. Um, good quick question on uh, SSE. Mm -hmm. What does, uh, and I'm sure there's this question from the audience, what enables that private access? Like what do you need to deploy as sort of the, the network proxy to get you onto that RDP machine or that SMB share from your, from your laptop or whatever client you're using? Okay, so 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 what what do I what do I need to do? I need to be able to connect to the edge, right? So what I can do is if I go in um, I, if I go into the portal, I can go and it will you know if you can actually select and download the GSA client today for Windows 10, Windows 11, and that will get me to the edge, right? Um, and uh, what it will do is I mean I'll I'll have to go in and, and enable you know the, I have to click on the right button and say yeah I want to use this uh, and that will do that um, uh, and having done that I'm now at the edge the next question is I need to publish right the application segments and to publish the application segments I've got to do two things uh, I've got to deploy a connector to on-prem right and, and that connector if you're familiar with it is the same connector is now uh, the, the application proxy uses right to begin with uh, it wasn't compatible, but now the latest connector uh, will run both the application proxy and it will un run the private access connector. So the application proxy is still there. If you're doing, if you're doing, if you're doing uh, you know, HTTPS to on-prem, you want to do Kerberos constrained delegation to a Windows auth, you know, web app, then it's the, the you still use the application proxy. But if you want to go to a network segment, all right? Well, I mean, effectively, the, the application proxy takes you to the network segment because it is just that website. But if you want to go to an application segment such as SMB share, et cetera, uh, then what you need to do is you can either use quick access. So with quick access, you've got a single application and everyone connects through this single application to what's on-prem. Uh, or you go enterprise apps and you have an individual application for each on-prem Thing. So you can have one conditional access policy for your SMB shares, you know, and it might be just that you want terms of use. You know, if you use this information externally, you've got to do the other thing. Um, and um, uh, so, so there's that. The other, the other, absolutely, anyone use tenant restrictions? Okay, tenant restrictions work absolutely beautifully in SSE. They give you everything you need. So tenant restrictions, if you're not familiar with tenant restrictions, the idea is I, I'm, I'm a contractor, right? I'm working on-prem, your on-premises. I'm sitting down at one of your machines, right? And I go, aha, I know what I can do. I can connect to an external Azure tenant 
and I can take all your data and save it up there, all right? And tenant restrictions stops that happening. Now, it was very, in the very early uh, days of tenant restrictions, you basically had to do it at network level. And then they brought out tenant restrictions version two, which does it at browser level, but it doesn't do it terribly well. Tenant restrictions v2 works beautifully with SSE. Um, and it does everything you could hope for. You know, it stops it stops token replay and all sorts of all sorts of stuff. Um, so yeah, did I answer your question? You, you did indeed. And I saw I asked that because I saw a few people when you showed the RDP thing go. How does that work? That's magic. Like this dark art has, has appeared. Um, but well, it, it I, is magic. It is magic. It's but Microsoft I think magic. it's it's always yeah. interesting. Like the, when the first person told me that it's just the app proxy, the same thing doing it, it was sort of like, oh, of course it is. That that makes complete sense. So um, yeah, I just yeah. wanted to make sure. I mean, are there any that. other questions? I'm more than happy. I mean, I, I don't know how, how quickly we, we need to probably, get out of we, here. We, we, we've but... got a couple of minutes for any okay. questions, if there are any from the audience. Um, but if not, then we can wrap up. Any questions from the audience? Any others? Or, or any questions when, when as, as I'm as clearing we're mingling, up, I'm absolutely. Happy to answer. So, well, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, again, thank you, John. Um, amazing session as always, and uh, hopefully, um, all of you can go and try with some of these new things. Restricted management admin units is actually my favourite because that's helped me in a lot of uh, FSI customers where they've been a bit uh, funny about who can do what to what groups and what users. Uh, really useful when you've got political challenges between like an Office 365 team and an Azure team and they want to be touching certain parts but they don't trust the Office 365 team not to touch the Azure stuff. Like restricted management admin units really solve that problem so um, definitely give it, a, give it a look and go and play with it but be careful because as you say you can lock your global admins out of it so be Think about it before you enable it, um, because that could be dangerous. Um, and yeah, and that, that, that's us for this year. So thank you all for attending. Um, we will be uh, keeping you up to date on the uh, WhatsApp group and via Meetup, so you'll get some email notifications there as well. Uh, and we'll be back. Our first one is officially in the calendar from what we agreed earlier in late January. So um, we'll get that out, um, but they may change. So hence why we haven't published anything just yet. But we hope to see you all at the big festive Meetup. So remember to sign up to that and uh, check that one out. It's on the Silicon Brighton website. Um, and yeah, thank you all again, and um, we'll see you again next year. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess we, we we could do next year when it's out a, a, a full-blown SSE session. There will be lots of interest for that. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure that that would be something that people would love to get hands-on with as well, potentially. So maybe we can we can think about something there. Oh, yeah, we do a hands-on <laughs> workshop. <laughs> Absolutely. Perfect. Right. Well, thank you all. And, um, yeah, please take yourself to any pizza that's left and any drinks. Uh, otherwise, it's going in the bin. So please take it home if you want to, if you want lunch tomorrow. Um, and, yeah, we'll catch you next year. Thank you all. Thank you.